Hello, we are going to begin our Bible study here in just a moment in Genesis chapters 10 through 14. Uh, we're continuing to record sermons and Bible classes, obviously, for the next few weeks. Lord willing, hopefully soon we'll be able to gather uh, on Wednesday nights at the building and go through this together. So if you have your workbook, we're going to be on page number 21. This is lesson number 10. So let's go to God in prayer, and then we're going to begin. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for the beautiful day you've given us. Thank you, Father, for your blessings that you provide for us every day. Even in the midst of distress and confusion and questions, we know, Father, that you are still in control, that you love us very much. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will bless us at this time. Be with our president, be with our vice president, be with all of those who are leading this country. Bless them. Be with the physicians and the nurses nurses and all the staff at hospitals and other places that are working diligently to care for people in need. Help us, Father, to continue to stay faithful to you and confident in you. We know, Father, that you are with us at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we are continuing in our Bible class in the book of Genesis. We've already looked at the story of Abraham, or I'm sorry, the story of uh, Noah and the ark. Abraham is on my mind because we're going to be looking at Abraham. And as we move on into Genesis, Abraham is going to play a big part from Genesis chapter, really chapter 11 and verse 27, all the way through the middle part of Genesis chapter 25. So this is going to be a little bit different with me. I have a lot of notes. I'm going to try to keep this a little bit more concise. It's, it's a little bit more of a challenge um, teaching in front of a camera with no one else here uh, or no one in the audience. So uh, my sermon was about 40 minutes this past Sunday. Um, and, you know, there's always a danger of kind of going longer because you're just I'm just talking to a camera. So I'm going to look at my notes quite a bit and try to really stay concise. So the introduction in, the, in page number 21 says, After the recreation, God had told man to spread out over the whole earth. But they didn't. In this story of crime and punishment, we see the beginning of the nations, which leads into the beginning of God's nation through Abraham. So let's just kind of walk our way through these questions. If you have questions, please let me know. Question number one. This section here is looking at the division into nations. What had God told man to do in Genesis 9, verse number 1? The Bible says there, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That sounds like what God told Adam and Eve. So they were to multiply, fill the earth. But what do we find man avoiding in Genesis chapter 11, verse 4? Well, in verse 1 it says, Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone, and they used tar for mortar. They said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So what are they trying to do? They're trying to stay together. They don't want to be scattered abroad the face of the whole earth. So Genesis 4 and verse 12 and verse 17, you remember God told Cain, you will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Yet what do we find in verse 17 of chapter 4? He's going to build a city. It seems like he's trying to do the exact opposite of what God wanted him to do. This seems to be the case as well with the people. Question number two, what was man's goal in building the city and the tower in chapter 11? Well, in verse 4, let us build for ourselves a city, a tower whose top will reach into heaven. Let us make a name for ourselves, otherwise we'll be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So we see what they were trying to do, and we see their intent. Now, they wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted to stay together. This, uh, How did this mirror Eve's sin? Uh, you could say, you know, looking at Eve, she wanted to be wise like God or equal like God. Um, and I think we could say the same thing here with respect to these people seeking to be like God. And there is pride involved in this. They're trying to work independently of God. They're unified, excuse me, but they're not consulting with God at all. Uh, God wanted the earth to be, to, be, to be filled up. And yet they're trying to do the exact opposite of what God wanted them to do. So they're not listening uh, to God as well. So pride certainly uh, 
is, uh, is something that we find in this story. Uh, what's God's response? Question three in Genesis 11, verses six through eight. And how is it parallel with what happened in Genesis 3 and verse 22 through 24? In Genesis 3 and verse 24, so he drove the man out. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Adam and Eve, they were driven out. In Genesis chapter 11 and verse number 8, So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. They're scattered. So Adam and Eve, driven out. Now these individuals here, they are scattered. Isn't that interesting how that works? They wanted to do something to avoid being scattered upon the face of the whole earth. And what happens? <laughs> they are scattered abroad the face uh, of the whole earth. So I just thought that was interesting. You know, there's a, a passage in uh, John chapter 11 um, where the leaders are eventually going to, you know, they're, they're plotting to, to kill Jesus. And let me just turn over there. In John chapter 11 and verse 47, Therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, What are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Well, the very thing that they tried to avoid is eventually going to happen. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed in 70 AD. So we see here that man may have his own intentions and will, but who is still ultimately in control? Our Father in heaven is ultimately in control. And even despite their wickedness, the earth is going to be populated. The earth is going to be filled up and people are going to be scattered uh, everywhere. So I thought that was kind of an interesting point here um, where the earth is going to be, um, you know, people are going to be scattered abroad the face of the whole earth. Uh, question number four. Why did the wilderness wandering Jews need to know this account? Well, I think the big thought we could say here in question number four is uh, they needed to live for God. Uh, if they didn't, um, bad things are going to happen. They're going to be scattered as well. And I thought that's an interesting point, thinking about the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. When they did not live for God, what happened? They were scattered. Uh, they're going to be taken away into captivity. So I think that's something powerful as they're looking at this story. Pride, trying to do things independent of God, um, taking God out of the equation. It's never going to work out for good. And so they needed to continue to live for God and trust God. The second section here, question five, looks at the chosen nation. Uh, in the genealogy, question five of Genesis 11, 10 through 26, who are the ultimate descendants of Shem? So a couple of thoughts here. Verse number 10 and verse number 27. And we talked about these markers where a new section is going to begin. These are the records of the generations of Shem. In verse 27, now these are the records of the generations of Terah. So we know ultimately the descendants of Shem are going to be Abraham, then Isaac, and Jacob, and the 12 tribes of Israel, and eventually the Messiah. Uh, we see Shem in the genealogy of Jesus in Luke chapter 3. Uh, and so we know that ultimately uh, the Messiah is going to come from this uh, lineage. In Genesis chapter 11, Moses uh, spends a great deal of detail looking at the generations of Shem, and I believe it would be for that purpose uh, as well. Another thought, just reading Genesis chapter 11, maybe you picked up on this as well. It's interesting to see how the ages of the men slowly is decreasing. Prior to the flood, they're living hundreds of years, seven, eight, nine hundred plus years. Now here, um, their ages are getting um, shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, all the way to 148 years. So I thought that was interesting as well. And we do have details as well about Shem in Genesis chapter 10 and verse number 11 and also verse number 22. And so as we think about 
uh, this cho chosen nation here, uh, they're getting uh, information about uh, this lineage of Shem. Uh, what is the first thing, question number six, we learn about Sarai other than she was Abram's wife? Well, we know in Genesis chapter 11 that she was barren. She had no child. Chapter 11 and verse number 30. And that's going to obviously play a big part. Uh, Genesis chapter 12 through 25 is all about Abraham and Sarah and them trusting in God. These promises God's gonna, going to give to Abraham, uh, and yet at the moment, uh, Sarah has no child. So question seven, why is this important to the wilderness wandering Jews? Well, they were children of promise. And even though Sarah didn't have a child initially, what happened? Well, God is going to fulfill his promise. God is going to provide, and just as he provided for Abraham and Sarah, they're going to have to trust in him and know that he will do the same. And so as you look at, <coughs> excuse me, question number eight here, as we dive into Abraham, uh, Abraham is such an important person in the story of the Bible. As we look at the promises that God is going to give Abraham here, beginning in Genesis chapter 12, this is really going to give us a nice little outline of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, there are more than three promises that God gave here in Genesis chapter 12 that we'll read about. Uh, but the land promise, the nation promise, this is really what the Old Testament, the rest of the Old Testament is going to be about. So it's interesting how from G Genesis 12 through 25, things begin to really kind of slow down. Chapters 1 through 11, we have a, a, a lot of time that has passed. We see the problem. What's the problem? The problem of sin with Adam and Eve, with Cain, with uh, the, the world in Genesis chapter 6. Uh, even with respect to Noah uh, and his son and the, the men in the days of the Tower of Babel, we see this huge problem. So what's the solution? Where well, we start to see even more the sneak preview of what God is going to do. And it's going to come through Abraham and through his lineage, ultimately through the Messiah. When you think about Abraham, there are a couple of places where we get some additional details outside of Genesis about him and his family. In, Je in Joshua 24, in verse number 1, Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and their judges and their officers, and they presented themselves before God. Verse 2, Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, From ancient times your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I, I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. So we get some details about uh, the family of Abraham and how they had served other gods. Uh, Stephen is going to go back to Abraham in Acts chapter 7 as he stood before the priest and gives this powerful sermon, which ultimately is going to cost him his life. In Acts 7 and verse 2, Hear me, brethren and fathers. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran, and said to him, Leave your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. From there, after his father died, <coughs> God had a move to this country in which you are now living. And we know other places like Hebrews where you have men like men and women, men like um, Enoch and uh, Abel and Noah and Moses. Moses gets uh, a number of verses, but who gets the most? Abraham. And so Abraham is obviously a very important person. Um, and the New Testament says so much about him as well. Uh, even with what we read a couple of weeks ago at services, the last time we were able to gather together, if you remember in uh, Galatians chapter chapter 3, uh, he said in verse 26, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free man. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise.
So there's so many powerful lessons for us to talk about as we start looking at Abraham. And the question, question number eight, what did God promise Abraham? Look at Genesis 12 and verse one. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing and I'll bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And then in verse seven, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to your descendants, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. So why did the wilderness wandering Jews need to hear this promise? You know, this big promise that he seems to be focusing on here is that Abraham and his descendants, they're going to they're gonna receive this land. He said, to your descendants, I will give this land. Well, they are the descendants of Abraham. So they would need to trust that what God was telling Abraham um, well, they already knew what God told Abraham was true, and, and uh, they needed to know that what God and all the promises that God had gave, given to Abraham, uh, indeed, they would, they would come to pass. And so they would ultimately have to trust um, uh, what God had told Abraham. Listen, your descendants are going to receive this land, and now they are in this journey. They're headed towards the promised land, and so they're going to have to trust what God said. Question number nine, how does Abram's sojourn in Egypt in Genesis 12, 10 through 20, mirror the Jews' experiences? So we know the Israelites had, um, had left Egypt out of slavery and bondage. And looking at Genesis chapter 12, we see Abraham uh, being deceitful, uh, lying about essentially his relationship with uh, his wife, Sarah. Uh, and, indeed, um, they were... Um, I guess half brother and half sister, uh, but uh, he said um, in Genesis chapter 12 and verse number 11, there's a famine that took place. It came about when he came near to Egypt that he said to Sarah, his wife, see now I know that you are a beautiful woman. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say that you are my sister uh, so that it may go well with me because of you and that I may live on account of you. So the deception there is he, he just didn't want them to know that um, Sarah was, was also his wife. So we see that there's a problem that's going to take place here. Um, Sarah was his half-sister, um, and, and yet he's leaving out some of these details, and he's doing this to uh, preserve himself. Uh, she's a beautiful woman, and he said in verse 13 that I may live on account of you. And so what we find here, um, there's going to be problems. And uh, ultimately, I think the comparison here in question number nine are the plagues that came about upon Pharaoh. Um, and what's interesting is that Pharaoh said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that, th that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here's your wife. Take her and go. Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they ex escorted him away with his wife and all that belonged to him. And so problems came along, and what we find, though, is that God was protecting Abraham and Sarah. And uh, so I think the similarity there uh, were, the, were the plagues that took place uh, upon those uh, in Egypt. Uh, what should this story remind wandering Israel of as it made its way to the promised land? Question number 10. Well, uh, God was continuing to be with Abraham and his wife, Sarah, and he would do the same for them. And so they had been delivered, and, uh, and so God would continue to deliver them on their way to the promised land. There's a lot of things we can say about this story here. Um, you see the faith of Abraham where... Uh, Abraham is listening to God. He's going to get up and he's going to uh, move and he's going to trust in God and yet um, he's going to eventually make his way um, to, to Egypt. Uh, and so, you know, he goes back to where he was back in chapter 13. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev, he and his wife and all that belonged to him and lot with him. Now, Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and in gold. He went on his journeys from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent 
had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. So eventually he goes back to where he was, and this takes us into the story of Lot. Uh, Abram and Lot are going to be separated. The trouble that arose, question number 11, is that both Abram and Lot had a lot. They were rich in livestock, silver and gold, verse 2, with respect to Abram. And then verse number 5, uh, Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. And so the problem was the land could not sustain them while dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. So now there's going to be strife uh, between the herdsmen. And so Abraham is going to take charge of being a leader, and he's going to say, listen, let's figure this out. So he gives Lot the first opportunity to decide what land that he wants. And the land that Lot chose in verse number 10 of chapter 13, Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord. This is a beautiful land, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zoar. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and, the Lot, and Lot journeyed eastward, thus they separated from each other. So we find this separation that's going to be taking place here. And um, the, the point here that I think um, the author of all this is trying to, to make in, in verse number 12, the land is, or question number 12, the land is described as being, um, it's beautiful, it looked great. And while a description, question number 13, of being like Eden and like Egypt seems wonderful, wonderful on the surface, what underlying problems do these description, uh, descriptions present? Well, we know, verse 13, now the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. So I think there's some great application here uh, that, uh, yeah, it looked, it looked great, but looks are deceiving. And the people there were very wicked in nature. And so question number 14, why did the wandering Jews need to hear God's word to Abram well, look at verse 14. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, Now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, I will give it to you and to your descendants forever. So they needed to hear this, that, listen, this land now that God had told Abraham way back then that they were going to receive, now that was a land flowing with milk and honey. I will make your descendants, verse 16, as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Arise, walk about the land through its length and breadth, for I will give it to you. And Abram moved his tent. And so they needed to focus upon uh, this promise that, that God had given to, to Abraham there, uh, that, uh, that they were going to be, receive this land and while the land that Lot chose initially was a better, I guess you could say a better land, uh, by the time this promise was fulfilled, uh, the land of Canaan would be that, that land that was beautiful, flowing with milk and honey. Now, the other thought, I guess you could say, that land that Lot chose, that's, uh, that's ultimately going to be destroyed. And so things around the Israelites may have been very appealing, but they needed to, again, trust in God and beware because there were dangers uh, that were going to be around them. Question number 15 here. What happened to Lot in the beautiful land according to Genesis chapter 14? Well, what we find is that Lot's going to find himself in a lot of trouble. Uh, and so in Genesis chapter 14, uh, verse number 11, then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food supply and departed. So we see war taking place. They also took Lot, Abram's nephew, and his possessions and departed, for he was living in Sodom. So we get the rest of the story in Genesis 18 and 19 with respect to Sodom and Gomorrah. So Abraham is going to come to the rescue. And it's pretty powerful. And we see uh, just all the things that, that Abram had, uh, 318 men, uh, trained men, according to verse number 14, and they're going to go... Uh, and rescue Lot, uh, and certainly his family as well. Uh, and so it's interesting that Abraham is a blessing to Lot and to his family by delivering them. Uh, and then in verse number or question number seventeen, uh, 
how does the situ situation with Melchizedek, and we read a lot about Melchizedek, only in a couple other places. He was both, according to Genesis chapter 14, a king and a priest. Uh, we read about Melchizedek in Psalm 110, and then in the book of Hebrews, uh, Christ is going to be compared, or going to be like Melchizedek, actually in Hebrews chapter 5, 6, and 7. Let me just read a, a text here so I don't misquote it. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 6 here, uh, verse 20, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And so uh, there's a lot to consider with this man, Melchizedek, who just kind of jumps into the scene here in chapter 14. But what we find, Melchizedek, he's going to bless Abram. And that ties back to those promises that God had given to Abram back in Genesis chapter 12. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And so we, we see those promises here uh, that he's going to uh, um, he's gonna bless, uh, bless Abraham. Uh, certainly his name is great. Um, as God had uh, talked about as well, going back to uh, the Genesis chapter 12. So the last question here, and I move kind of fast and it's already almost 30 minutes. Uh, why did Moses' original audience need to hear this story? I think the big point here is that those promises that God had given to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12, um, they're going to take a while to be fulfilled, especially that, that third of the, the nation promise with Isaac eventually one day being born. But God is slowly fulfilling his promises. He is with Abraham. He's with Sarah. Uh, he's providing for them. They need to listen to him. They need to trust in him. When they don't, bad things are going to happen. And we're going to see they're going to try to take matters into their own hands later on as well. So the Israelites needed to hear this because they are the descendants of Abraham. And they have a great land waiting for them. They need to trust in God. We certainly need to be reminded of that as well that our Father in heaven is always faithful. He's always going to provide. That's a quick overview of Genesis chapters 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. So I hope you read this and take some more time to consider uh, everything that's found uh, in these chapters here. So uh, we'll pick up this, Lord willing, next week, and uh, we'll keep on going through the book of Genesis. So um, one thing you may want to do is read Genesis 12 through 25, uh, to get the full story of Abraham, and we'll pick up this story next time. Thank you for watching this. Talk to you later. Take care, and God bless.